So the topic for this section is spatial statistics. Our goal was to do a broad overview of spatial statistics. We're not going to get into the nuts and bolts of how different tests work. Um, our goal is really to focus on what these tests are for, what they tell you, the type of data that you, that you um, can provide them, and then how you interpret the results. We're going to start off with kind of a, a more general overview of statistics um, and just summarizing data. Then we'll talk a bit about sampling, and then we'll look at ways to summarize the spatial central tendency and spatial variability of data. And then we'll look at more local and, and global and local tests of things like spatial autocorrelation and clusters of hot or, or high values or low values. Okay, so before we get into the nuts and bolts of this, just a couple reminders about what's unique about geographic data or geospatial data and things we need to consider when we're actually analyzing them and then also just interpreting uh, the results of our analyses. So it's always important to remember that our, um, our data are, occur over a map space and thus they relate to a relocation on the land. Um, so whenever you're, uh, whenever you're undertaking a study, um, it's generally specific to a certain location, right? Um, and you have maybe a specific like aggregating unit like county boundaries, census blocks, census tracts, watersheds um, that you're doing your analysis at. Um, there's also things to consider in terms of how patterns may or may not be consistent over space. So spatial heterogeneity basically indicates that relationships we see at one location may not hold true at another location. So for example, if you see a strong relationship between um, like a dis disease occurrence and, um, and you know, like a, a certain population characteristic at one location that may not hold true at another location. So relationships can vary over space. Um, the whole concept of spatial autocorrelation is central to spatial statistics and just spatial analysis in general. Well, the idea is basically that um, if the near things tend to be more correlated or related than things that are further away. And as if you've had a statistics class, you will may remember that one of the key kind of uh, assumptions is that all of your samples are independent. So spatial autocorrelation kind of indicates that that this, this the in, spatial independency may be an issue. And there are techniques for measuring that and techniques that are more robust to dealing with spatial autocorrelation when undertaking an analysis. The same also holds true in the concept of time. So Generally speaking, observations closer together in time tend to be more similar than observations that are further apart in time. Um, also, patterns that are, you see at one time may not hold into the future or be true in the past, right? Um, so there's heterogeneity in patterns both across space and time. And against temporal autocorrelation is this idea that features closer in time may be more similar to each other. Um, obviously, there's other kind of interesting, like longer scale patterns, right? So we have like seasonal oscillations, um, decadal uh, phenomenon, like in the case of weather, where you can see patterns that, that um, correlate at different time periods or kind of at different levels through this like oscillation of a pattern. And then lastly, the modifiable error unit problem. Again, the idea there is that when you aggregate data, so you're taking like raw data and you're aggregating it or, or summarizing it to a, a aggregating unit like a county or a census unit or a watershed that you may not get the same results if you aggregate the data differently. So um, the idea here is that the aggregating unit or the scale is an inherent part of the analysis. Okay, so um, let's just go through a broad overview of just it, just how we explore summarize data. We're going to start off by looking at some univariate summarizations, meaning one variable as opposed to comparing multiple variables. So one common way that we summarize um, a single variable is with the histogram. So the idea of the histogram is that the variable of interest is, is plotted on the x-axis. So this would be our, our variable of interest. And then what's plotted on the y-axis is the count of, of the values falling in a certain range. 
So the user must define a bin width. So this is one bin. So maybe that's if say you're looking at this is depths. So maybe your your bin width is is uh, five meters or two meters or ten meters, right? So you define a width, and effectively you're counting the number of observations that fall in that data range, and that's what specifies the height of the of the bar, right? So uh, Again, if you have smaller bins or larger bins, you're going to see a different pattern. There's not, or maybe not different, but um, you know, you you're going to see you're going to see a, the 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 visualization is not going to be the same, right? So um, if you have smaller bins, you may end up seeing more like local noise or local patterns. If you use a very large bin, it may be a more general pattern. Again, if you're if you're really wanting to explore your data, it's maybe a good idea to produce histograms using uh, different bin widths to see how the patterns compare, right? So again, the y-axis is going to be the count of the number of observations uh, within each bin. Um, sometimes that's labeled as a frequency, but effectively meanings, means the same thing, right? So in, the, in this data set here, you know, these values are more frequent. You can see that there's a bit of a tail out to the, to the right, so there's some outlier high values. Um, in this graph, um, this is depths um, for a lake. So this is kind of an opposite pattern. So most of the values are fairly low. So this is kind of the more dominant values. And then you it kind of tapers off here to deeper values, right, or, or higher depths, right? So we would call this kind of a skew to the left pattern, where this is more of a skew to the right pattern. So anyway, looking at these graphs can give you a sense of how the data are distributed, if they're approaching a normal distribution, if there's a skewness, or maybe if there's bimodal or something. Another common use of, of histograms and this and these types of plots, which we'll talk about in a second, is to compare categories. So a kernel density plot, for those of you in GIS, this is the same thing as a kernel density surface, where we're basically looking at the density of observations, except in, in a space, we're doing this over two dimensions, height and width, or, or yeah, height and width, north, north, south, slash east, west. Um, when we're doing this in a graph space for one variable, we're just doing it in one dimension. So effectively, you're fitting this function through the data distribution to see like how it's distributed. So this is similar to a, a histogram. It's just fitting this kernel density function instead of using the, the bins, right? In this case, we're actually plotting different distributions for three different groups here. So this is a famous data set. This is the empty cars data set. Um, if you ever take like a data science class, you'll probably run into this. But effectively, it's observations for different vehicles with different um, characteristics of the vehicle summarized. So what I'm showing here is miles per gallon um, for fuel efficiency on the x-axis. So that's our variable of interest. And, and now, in this case, our axis is density. Note you can also use frequency or count um, as opposed to a density uh, when, you, when you create these. But basically, this is allowing us to look at and compare the distribution between uh, the distribution of fuel efficiencies between four cylinder vehicles in the data set, six cylinder, and eight cylinder vehicles in the data set. Right? So we can see generally that the, the four-cylinder vehicles are getting higher fuel efficiency. So this is your, your four-cylinder vehicles there. And then the middle ones here are your six-cylinder vehicles and then the eight-cylinder vehicles. Another kind of key thing is that this is showing us more than just the uh, just like kind of the central tendency, right? We also get a sense of the distribution. So like the four-cylinder vehicles tend to be much more varied, right, in terms of their fuel efficiency in comparison to say the six-cylinder vehicles that are a bit more clustered. And the, uh, the uh, eight-cylinder vehicles um, have kind of this almost like mo multimodal thing where you've got kind of multiple humps here, right? So anyway, the, it gives you a sense of both the central tendency and also the variability in the data and allows you to compare groups. Uh, we probably don't need to linger on this very long, but you know there, we have different measures of central tendency that we use. The most common is the mean, so you know add up all the values, divide by the number of values. But some other options are the median, which is the second quartile or the 50th percentile. So effectively, it's the most middle number. So 50% of the measurements are or are below it, and 50% are above it. 
and the mode is the most commonly occurring number. Um, that maybe doesn't make a lot of sense if you have a bunch of unique values and there are no like repeating values. Um, so anyway, these are just different ways to summarize essential tenancy. We traditionally have used the mean most often. Uh, one issue with the mean potentially is that it's fairly sensitive to outliers, meaning high and low values can shift the mean um, a good bit. In contrast, medians are less sensitive to that, so some people argue the medians are more meaningful um, if you're not worried about like extreme high or low values. Um, but obviously there's different schools of thought on that. So anyway, um, you, the mean and the median are what we see used most often. The mode, again, is the most common value. That could be useful if you have a lot of repeating values. Um, okay, um, that's just the central tendency, but again, that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is variability, right? So um, there's a couple different ways that we can measure variability or dispersion. The range is fairly simple. It's just the max minus the minimum, so the full range of values. This is very sensitive to outliers because it actually is only considering the highest value and the lowest value. Um, the variance is effectively taking the value, each value subtracting the mean, and then squaring those and summing them and then dividing by the number of samples. So we're, do, it's, we're basically doing like a squared difference from the mean. So that means that the units of the variance is going to be in the square of the units. So if you were going back to our depth example, if you were trying to calculate the variance for depth, the units of the, of the variance will actually be in say square meters as opposed to meters, right? So it's common to take the, the variance and uh, and, and take the square root and that's standard deviation, which is what we generally see most often. So again, that's taking each value, subtracting the mean, squaring it, summing them up, then dividing by the number of samples, and then taking the square root to return back the original units, right? So larger standard deviations, larger variances tend to indicate that the data are more varied or more dispersed, um, less clustered, than um, than if it were a um, than, uh, than if it was a smaller value. Um, note that there are different formulas for calculating the standard deviation from a from a mean or, or sorry from a population versus a sample. Um, we don't really need to worry about that here, um, but just as a side note, um, there are slightly different formulas for that that are that are listed here. Okay, another common way just to look at the distribution of a single variable is as a box plot. So a box plot is used to show um, the kind of full distribution of data, and these are the different components that are included. So you generally have the minimum, so the lowest value, and then the highest value. The difference between those is obviously the range. So if we uh, took the difference between these two values there, then that would be your range, right? Um, and then we have the first quartile. So the first quartile means that 25% of the data are below it and 75% are above, as shown over here. Then the third quartile is kind of on the other end. So there's 75% below and 25 above as opposed to 25 below and 75% above, right? The difference between the third quartile and the first quartile is known as the interquartile range or IQR. Sometimes that's used as opposed to using the range because it's less impacted <clears throat> by extreme values. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, we also have the median, which is also the 50th percentile or the second quartile. So 50% of the data are below it and 50% are above. So it's like the middle value, right? One thing that you may um, have noticed is that a box plot generally doesn't include the, the mean. Um, that's kind of a common misconception. So some people think that this center line here is supposed to represent the mean, but actually it represents the median. Sometimes people will plot the mean um, on a box plot. Generally that's just done as like a point or, or a symbol, right? So for example, like you might see like an X or a circle or something and that would indicate the mean. Okay, um, another really interesting use of box plot is not just to look at the distribution of a single variable, but to look at the distribution of that single variable broken up by categories as a means to compare categories. So let's start with this one. This was the same um, 
plot we looked at, um, or the same data we looked at earlier when we were looking at the kernel density plot. So this is showing the distribution of um, fuel efficiency for 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 different cylinder number of cylinders, right? So these are our four cylinders with pretty, uh, generally better fuel efficiency, the six cylinders, and then the eight cylinders here. Now, um, one other thing that's important is, again, not just central tendency, but variability. So as I mentioned earlier, when we looked at the kernel density plot, this, uh, the, the four-cylinder vehicles seem to be more dispersed. And you can see that here if, um, on the box plot based on the inner quartile range. So that would be the, the IQR there for, for the four cylinders versus the six and the eight. All right. Um, this other example, this is showing um, runoff, which is you can think of as the amount of, of water in a stream. Um, for different months. This is real data from a weir at, within the Ferno Experimental Forest. So we can see this kind of seasonal trend where it's generally wetter or there's more water in the stream kind of through, through the winter and spring months, then kind of drying up more in the summer, and then maybe getting a little wet, more wet later in the fall. So there's a, definitely a seasonal pattern there in the amount of water in the stream. And we can also see maybe changes in the variability across these different measurements. So we see generally less variability here in the summer months than maybe we do um, you know, in, the, in the winter months. Okay, <clears throat> this is just another example. This is uh, the, NL or the, the NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, for uh, five different land cover types, so water, bare and forest herbaceous woodlands. If you're not familiar with this, the idea of NDVI is that it correlates with greenness or vegetation health. So green healthy vegetation tends to have a high NDVI and then um, you know, unhealthy vegetation or non-vegetated non areas have a low NDVI and that's calculated using the, the red and the near infrared channels. So in this data set, we can see a low NDVI for water, which is kind of expected, right? Um, and for barren lands, which are expected. And these are our kind of different vegetations. They're all higher. The highest is woodlands. If you're wondering why that is, this is actually calculated from a leaf off image. Um, this is over a mine site. And um, in the mine site, these kind of lower, lower um, woody vegetation is more deciduous, or sorry, conifers evergreens, whereas the forests are more deciduous. So since it's in the winter, that's why you see that difference. Um, okay, so another note about box plots, it's common to see points plotted. Um, so for example here, either high or low. Different software will do this differently. Um, one common setup is that if a value is more, if a high value is more than 1.5 IQR from the third quartile, then it's gonna be plotted as a point um, and um, and if in, in contrast for the low values, if it's if it's lower than 1.5 IQR from the first quartile, then it's pointed as a point or plotted as a point. So you could not do this, and you could just extend it you know, all the way up to the highest value there, something like that, right? But in this case, they're just doing a cutoff and then plot plotting those as kind of like outlier points. So there's different ways to, to do that. Okay, so those are all plots where we're looking at a single variable. Um, so now let's look at plots where we have multiple variables that we want to compare. Um, so one of the most common ways to compare two continuous or numeric variables is with the scatter plot. So this is going back to our, our uh, cars, uh, our empty cars data set. So here we're comparing the fuel efficiency uh, with the weight of the car, right? So this, we kind of generally see an inverse or indirect pattern there, right? So what this kind of indicates is that heavier cars tend to have lower fuel efficiency, which makes sense, right? Um, note that when you do have a scatter plot, it's common to plot the independent variable on the x-axis and the, and the dependent variable on the y-axis. So in this case, we're kind of assuming that 
the the fuel efficiency of the vehicle is impacted by the weight of the vehicle as opposed to the weight of the vehicle being impacted by its fuel efficiency now granted that's now that kind of makes sense in this case sometimes when you're comparing to values and there isn't one that's independent or and one that's dependent or one that's like causing the response in the other um, where which you put on the x-axis and which you put on the y-axis is somewhat arbitrary um, but in this case, it makes sense to have the car weight on the x-axis um, since it's in, it's, we are assuming that's impacting the fuel efficiency. Note that in these plots, you can also use other graphical parameters to show other measurements. So here I'm using the size of the point to show the horsepower and the, and the and unordered colors to show the nominal variable, which or ordinal variable in this case, of number of cylinders. Um, so you can incorporate additional variables by... Um, uh, using other graphical parameters, so size, shape, um, color, so on and so forth. Okay, um, this is just another example. Um, so here we're showing GDP per capita uh, on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis. Um, and you kind of see a pretty clear relationship between those two things there. Um, it's not linear relationship, but it does seem to be uh, a relationship. And again, we're, sh we're using the collar and the specifically unordered collars to show a nominal variable, in this case the continent that the country is on, and then size to show a continuous variable, in this case the population. And this is from the Gapminder data set, which is another fairly famous data set. Okay, so what if you want to compare more than two uh, uh, continuous variables, but each but pairwise or two at a time? So one way that you can do that is with a scatter plot matrix. Okay, so scatter plot matrix basically plots each pair um, in a matrix or an array. Um, so for example, this is showing the relationship between NDVI and percent canopy cover, right? So this allows you to kind of compare each variable, each pair, and get a sense of which ones seem to be most correlated with each other, right? So for example, it looks like, for example, there's more correlation between brightness and greenness than there are between, say, greenness and percent canopy cover. It's kind of interesting, just based on these distributions. Note that the diagonal in this case is comparing the variable with itself, which is unnecessary because that would be a perfect correlation. So here they're just showing the histogram so you can see the data distribution. And then all the off diagonals are comparing two pairs. Um, if you are interested in kind of quantifying the correlation between two variables, there are measures for that. We're not going to get into that in here, um, but just as a quick note, um, if you're specifically interested in the linear correlation between two variables, you can generally um, use the Pearson correlation coefficient. Um, if you're interested in correlation that's not linear, then you're maybe going to use the Spearman or the T Kendall Tau um, methods. Um, note that those two methods, even though they're nonlinear, they still assume a monotonic relationship. So increasing, uh, decreasing in one direction as opposed to a more complicated trend. So you could use a Spearman or Kendall coefficient to look at like a relationship between two variables that was something like this, right? Or this. So increasing in one direction, but not linear. However, a monotonic relationship would be something like this, right? Where it's kind of like you know diverging, so increasing at this is the low, and it's, it's, it increases as you go up or down from that point, right? So this is not monotonic because it's not increasing or decreasing in any direction. So neither Spear, or neither the Pearson, Spearman, or Kendall Tau really are useful for for these types of situations. If, if you're interested in nonlinear monotonic trends, though, you can use Spearman or Kendall for that. And then obviously the linear trend, you're assuming it's a linear relationship, and that's the case for Pearson. Okay, let's talk a little bit about distribution. So you, a term that comes up a lot um, when you talk about statistics is the term parametric, or like a parametric test, a parametric statistic. So generally, those are statistical tests that assume some type of distribution um, as part of the analysis. 
So one common distribution that's assumed when you're looking at data is what's known as a normal distribution. So the normal distribution or Gaussian distribution takes on this kind of bell shape. Um, so this is your typical bell shape pattern, right? Some other key characteristics of a normal distribution are that the mean, the median, and the mode are all the same. So this would be the, both the mean, the median, and the mode in, in this data set. So it's the most center, central value, so that's the median, and it's the average of all the values, the mean, and the most commonly occurring value, which would be, you know, again, the highest point here in the counts, so the mode, right? Um, in order for the mean and the median mode to be the same, there has to be some perfectly symmetrical on either side of this center line. Um, some other specifics is that 68.3% of the data fall within one standard deviation of the mean, 95.4% fall within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.7% fall within three standard deviations of the mean, which is this. Oh, actually, sorry, I wasn't going out far enough with those. Yep, there we go. Sorry, I went a little too far there. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the kind of general normal distribution um, yeah, characteristics. Now, obviously, with real data, it's, it's com uncommon unless you create a random normal distribution data set or something that you're going to have data that are perfectly normally distributed. So a lot of the question comes down to how close the normal distribution is, is good enough for the specific use case if it's assumed the data are normally distributed. Okay, so there are some ways to compare the distribution of data relative to a normal distribution. So <clears throat> skewness has to do with whether the data is symmetrical um, you know, relative to the the rather to either side of the curve, like relative to the median value. So um, this is generally associated with having a tail. So in this graph, we have this curve here in orange, which I'm drawing over in red, and this would be what we call skewed to the left. So it has values as these outlier low values. In contrast, this blue curve here, which I'm again drawing in in red now, um, is more skewed to the right, so it has these outlier high values, right? I've always found this a little bit confusing because um, it seemed to me since like the bulk of the data is kind of more to the right, then it would be skewed to the right. But what it's really talking about it is the direction of the tail, right, the long tail. So skewed to the left, skew to the right. Um, so that's skewness. So um, another thing we look at is how dispersed the data are relative to a normal distribution. So if the data are more clustered than a normal distribution, we generally call that leptocurtic. So that's the yellow trend here. So it's what we what's commonly referred to as light-tailed. So more clustered around the mean or median, the, cent the central tendency. And then in contrast to that, we have Platyocurtic, which is this red distribution, so it's more variable than a normal distribution. And then uh, here we have our normal distribution, which is uh, known as mesocurtic, right? So anyway, the, there are measures of skewness and kurtosis, which is looking at the heavier light-tailedness of the data, and those are ways to like numerically compare the distribution of data to a normal distribution. Another kind of graphic way to do it is with a um, QQ plot or quantile, quantile, or is it, it's either quantile, quantile, or quartile, quartile, I always forget, uh, plot. So um, yeah, so anyway, this is an example of a QQ plot. So in this case, you're basically comparing the true quantiles or distributions of the data with the distribution it would have if it were normal. If the the actual quantiles are 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 um are really similar to the theoretical quantiles, then that means that these points are going to fall along the line. So falling on the line basically indicates um, being close to normal, and then falling off the line in some way generally indicates that the pattern diverges from a normal distribution in some way. So again, the goal here is to basically compare the real distribution of the data, so the data quantiles, 
with the theoretical quantiles, so the quantiles that that would have if they were normally distributed. So this is showing some different representations of data um, relative to their QQ plot. So here we have a normal distribution. As you can see, the data quantiles align well with the theoretical quantiles, so they plot along that like one-to-one -one line. Um, here we have a skewed to the left distribution, and you can see this kind of takes on this uh, convex type shape. In contrast, we have this skewed to the right distribution, and now it's taking on this more concave type shape. And then leptocurtic, that's less, again, less variable than a normal distribution. We're seeing this kind of diverging high, the high part of the graph and diverging low in the low part of the graph. And with platyocurtic, again, more, um, more varied or heavy tailed than a normal distribution, that pattern flips. So high for the low, low for the high. Right. So anyway, this is a way to interpret, um, graphically kind of assess the, 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 the normality of a data distribution. So if you know how to read these, you can get a sense of whether the data are skewed left, skewed right, leptocurtic, platyocurtic. Um, I actually honestly find it easier though to just look at the, the kernel density plots or the histograms. There are statistical tests to assess for normality. We're not going to look at those here, but um, just as a side note, there are associated statistical tests for that also. Um, just a side note on some software related geostatistics. So obviously there's a lot of cool geostatistical tools in ArcGIS Pro, for, especially if you have the geostatistical analyst extension. Um, or is it statistical analyst extension? I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, if you have that statistical extension. Um, also in things like QGIS or in our like coding environments like Python and R. Um, another cool tool which is um, good for doing spatial statistical tests and data visualizations is Geoda. So if you're interested in that, there's a link here. So this is kind of a GUI based tool, meaning you don't really have to code or anything but it works inside of its own interface as opposed to inside of like ArcGIS or QGIS or something. So anyway, there's a link here if you want to investigate Geoda. Um, you can install it for free and um, it's pretty lightweight, so it won't eat up a lot of space or anything. Okay, sampling. So the next topic is sampling. So this has to do with how we select samples from a population that we're studying, right? Okay, so one the first thing is you have to kind of think about what you mean by population, right? So what is the population? So that has to do with all like the group that you're interested in studying. So for example, if you were doing a study of um, I don't know uh, blood pressure for for students at at a specific university, your population would be all the students at the university. If you're only interested in undergraduates blood pressure at a university, then your whole population would be undergrads at that university. If you were interested in the blood pressure of undergraduates in any institution of higher education in the entire United States, then that would be your population, right? So in short, it's important to determine what your population is. Um, note that your population can ob can obviously be something that's not a per like an individual. It could be your pop your individual units could be like groups. It could be things such as um, uh, products being manufactured at a factory. It could be um, in the spatial world things like spatial aggregating units, so watersheds, census units, counties. It could be pixels if you're dealing with with imagery, so on and so forth. So the issue is that it's generally impossible um, to, it's generally impossible to actually measure every individual in a population, unless you're dealing with a fairly small population. So instead, we generally are only able to make measurements from a subset of people from that population um, in order to, um, to like make some inference about the population. So when you perform a statistical test, the general idea is that you are, are taking a sample from a population 
doing a test in order to make an inference not about that sample but back to the entire population. So in order to do that it's important that you have a representative sample from the population and that's generally done by sampling in an unbiased randomized way. Unfortunately in the real world it's not always easy to actually create a unbiased assessment or sorry collect an unbiased sample uh, from a population. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about some different ways to do sampling in like a spatial context. All right, so uh, one way to do it is simple random sampling. So let's say your study area is a watershed and you're collecting soil, um, soil cores or something. So in this case, you would select random locations across the entire watershed and you would have to go to each of those locations and collect a soil core there. Um, sometimes with spatial simple random sampling people will set a minimum distance threshold. So for example you may not want to collect uh, soil samples that are closer than 10 feet from each other. Uh, one common use of that is something like if you're comparing the data to like a remotely sensed image or data set you maybe only want to you want it to only be possible to collect a single observation in any given pixel. So if you were dealing with like a Landsat image where the data are 30 by 30 meters, then you maybe wouldn't want to have the samples be any closer than, you know, 30 meters. So that's simple random sampling. So that's really nice because it is very statistically rigorous um, because it's randomized. However, it's not always easy to actually uh, yeah, to actually create a completely random sample. So imagine that you're actually on the field collecting this, so you'd actually have to go to all these locations. You, it, you may not have access rights or to a site, you know, with private property, um, or the train might be rugged, it might just not be possible for you to actually even get to some of these locations. So, there, so even though it's statistically rigorous, um, there are some complexities. Systematic sampling basically is collecting observations on a regular space pattern, like on a grid. So uh, obviously you can see that here. So collecting measurements every f every 10 meters, for example. Um, it's also common to collect measurements along transects. This is partially because it can be easier to like walk along a transect than it is to hike to random locations, right? So you would specify a start and end point and you would hike along that and you would either collect measurements on a regular basis, so like every 10 meters, every 100 meters, whatever. That's generally called systematic sampling along transects. Excuse me. And there's also like random sampling along transects where they're not evenly spaced. Um, there are some fields where transect-based measurements are used a lot. Uh, one common example is is in like forestry and forest administration. So the idea is um, if you, you basically would have a transect that you walk and every so often you're collecting whatever measurement you want, whether it's fuel bed depths or um, whether or not there's biomass there, height of the biomass, whatever. Um, stratified random sampling means that you're, it's random, but it's stratified or grouped based on a variable. In this example, I've stratified the sample based on land cover types. So um, uh, basically we're trying to, in this case, collect an equal number of samples in each land cover type. You could have other types of stratification. So for example, an equal number of features in, in, each, in each soil type or um, uh, in each rock formation, um, in each land ownership category or, or zoning rights or whatever. Um, note that they, they don't have to be equally proportioned. You may have different proportions per each strata, but the point is that you're, you're, you're specifying the proportion that should occur in each strata init uh, initially, um, as opposed to just um, you know, randomly selecting points. Um, one reason why people do this is if you are interested in, like, say, comparing groups, you need to, make sh you need to generally have a decent number of samples in each group. So if you have a landscape where certain groups are just not very prominent, so for example, in this case, this area is all the greens are different types of forest, so it's predominantly forest. 
um, if if it might it's just if you randomly select points, you're going to get a lot of forest, and you're not going to get a lot of other things like developed areas. So by doing a stratified sampling, this would make sure that you sample within those other strata. Okay, and then lastly, we have random sampling within clusters. So the idea here is that you define a subset of your study area, and then you collect random samples within that subset. So the clusters are the subsets, and then you're collecting samples randomly within those subsets. Okay, so um, again, that's generally done kind of for convenience. So you can have a smaller subset that you can um, easily access. So maybe you're only going to sample within areas there you have um, it's public or the landowners are allowing um, access to the to the property. Um, yeah, so anyway, it's, it's maybe not perfect situation, but it is a practical trade off between doing um, a purely random sample. Just as a couple of side notes, there are tools for doing these types of sampling routines in different geospatial software. So for example, QGIS R, ArcGIS Pro, they have tools for doing things like generating random points, selecting a random subset of features from a larger data set, like selecting random census blocks from all the census blocks in an area. Um, these are just some examples on ArcGIS, so there's this Create Random Points tool. Note with that, you can specify a minimum distance between points. This is generate points along a line, so if that could be used for you know, like transects uh, or, or, or uh, planning for like a transect-based collection. Um, so anyway, these are common processes. People need to be able to collect random locations or random subsets from a larger set. So uh, our geospatial statistical data science tools have tools for us to, to do those things. Another common task kind of related to sampling is to be able to take an extent and break it into smaller aggregating units. In order to do that, you need a shape that can perfectly fill the space or can fill the space without any gaps, right? So some common uses of that are hexagons, or some common shapes that have that characteristics are hexagons, triangles, and squares, as you can see here, right? Note that when you do have an odd shape like West Virginia, it's a good example of an odd shape, um, the ones on the margin here are not going to, they're going to be partial shapes. There's no real way around that. Um, this becomes less of an issue the smaller you make the, the shapes, obviously. Um, but, uh, but, but anyway, you're, you're always going to have some around the edges that are incomplete. So anyway, this is one way if you don't really have like a, a fixed aggregating unit or a meaningful aggregating unit, like a county bound, a county, if you're, say you're, you're studying counties or census units or something, you, but you still need to aggregate your data, you can come up with a kind of consistent way to, to just partition the landscape using a tessellation. Um, another kind of commonly, uh, another commonly related tool is a fishnet. Um, fishnets basically create a grid over a landscape. Sometimes people use this for, for sampling. Um, I actually use fishnets a lot just for drawing. So I'll create a fishnet over a landscape when I'm digitizing and I just use it as a guide as I draw. This is especially useful if you don't know where, where you're going to find the thing you're interested in. So you can draw over the entire landscape and use this as a guide as you go back and forth and draw so you don't get lost. So that's kind of not what we're using it for here in this context, but that's another use. So this is another way that you can kind of break a landscape up into units for sampling is create a grid or a fishnet over it. Note that in ARC, the general default or, um, is that when you create a fishnet, it actually uses, it creates polyline object as opposed to a polygon. Um, I generally prefer it to be a polygon, so um, I will change it to polygon, but obviously there's different use cases there. You can also specify the size of each cell, or you can specify the number of rows and columns of cells that you want um, within the extent. And note they don't have to be perfect squares, they can be you know, rectangular in shape too.